Very smart move to be part of In the Trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics, because we have a very smart former football player for the Buffalo Bills, now color analyst, very football smart. That is Eric Wood. Played here at Elder, went to Louisville, understands what the Cincinnati market's all about, understands how important this game is to the Cincinnati community and the Cincinnati Bengals, and he's part of this community, and then a big part, obviously, of the Buffalo Bills community as well. Eric Wood is the perfect person to talk about this playoff battle between the Bills and the Bengals. Appreciate you joining us in the trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics. As always, we have an outstanding guest, and we are in our studios with that outstanding guest, and it is none other than Eric Wood, Cincinnati kid himself, high school legend at Elder, went to Louisville, All-American, first-round pick, Buffalo Bills, center extraordinaire for the Buffalo Bills, now color analyst extraordinaire for the Bills Radio Network. Appreciate your time, my man. Yeah, my pleasure. I don't know that I was a high school legend. I might be a one now, but but definitely not while I was in school at Elder. I'll tell you what, it, it, it's funny how guys, you know, the development of, of guys during their athletic career, you know, some guys are shaving five times a week when they're 14 years old and other guys, you know, a, a, a cat can lick off the whiskers until they're a senior in high school and guys, kids mature at, at such different uh, ages and that that's something that's something that uh, recruiters and scouts in the NFL, everybody has to take all that into account when they're trying to project how guys are going to pan out. Right. Yeah, you're exactly right. I still don't shave five times a week. And so, <laughs> and so uh, yes, and especially with offensive linemen, because, you know, as well as anyone, Dave, especially nowadays, if you look across an NFL offensive line, most of those guys, they didn't play a lot of offensive line growing up. They yep. worked tight ends, defensive ends. They were. I don't want to say athletes, but they 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 weren't big their whole life, and that allowed them to have the mobility now to be able to mirror some of these elite defensive linemen. Yeah, and and you know it's interesting. Uh, this is back in you know late '60s and early set. Or not, I started at Syracuse uh, in 1970, so late '60s in high school, '66 to '70. It was like they wanted to see if you were a bigger body, can you play basketball? Right. Do you wrestle? Can you play baseball? Can you put the shot, throw the discus, do whatever other things athletically? So, you know, you're not just, and now it's discouraged. They want people, they want young guys to just, you know, I'm doing this sport and I'm focusing on this only, and I'm not going to do these other sports. And I'm telling you, if, if I did not play basketball, baseball, track and field, all that, th- that helped me big time, you know, with athleticism, uh, different, using different muscle groups differently and all that kind of stuff. I, I recommend that to anybody. And you don't get burnout. You don't get those overexertion injuries. I know people are politicking to get spring football in Ohio. And as long as it's managed, I'm fine with it. But as soon as you implement spring football, okay, now those guys might not be playing lacrosse or whatever else they're doing in the off season that adds to their athletic ability when they enter the football field. Also, you're going to be taking a lot of shots. Football is a physical sport. The injury rate, not in high school, but the injury rate is 100%. And so now you're catching more dings along the way leading up into college. And I know from experience, those guys that played down in Florida, some of those guys were burnt out by the time they got to college. You come from Ohio, you just play football during the season. You might play seven on sevens in the summer, but none of us were burnt out. We were excited to go play ball again. Absolutely. That's a, that's a tremendous point. No question about it. All right. So let's go back in the, in the little bit of the way back and uh, man, that uh, that Monday night football experience with Demar Hamlin, I mean, it, it was it was trauma. It was real life trauma. When I when I looked down on the field and saw them doing CPR, you know, and I and, and you see a, a just resuscitation going on, and you see a equipment out there to shock his heart back into a, a heartbeat. It's like wow, this is this is serious. And then you look at the the players crying, vomiting you know, looking and looking away and rubbing their heads. Can't believe what they're seeing. I was like, what is going on? What was going through your mind when all that was unfolding? 
Yeah, I, I was seeing the same things as you, Dave, and, and was just in a state of shock trying yeah. to make words of it. And we're both on the radio, so we don't even have the luxury of those being able to see it. And you can kind of lay out and just let the visual speak for itself. We got to describe the situation so that the listeners have an idea what's going on. And you're you're trying to describe the situation. You're trying to be sensitive to the situation. You're trying not to put your foot in your mouth, too, because right. anything you say could then be used against you tomorrow if you're wrong, if you misinterpreted the situation. If either of us would have said, man, these guys need to get out and play this game, you know, obviously that's going to be used against you. And, and we weren't getting any information that – the viewers weren't getting on TV or anywhere else because everyone was just in, in limbo. What's what's going on in this situation? It was it was awful. I never use binoculars throughout a game. I, I paid good money for LASIK eye surgery and I can see the field well. And Cincinnati's got as good of a booth view as you get in the league. Right. We'll also get another great booth view in Buffalo this week. But but I rarely ever get the binoculars out, but I did, and I almost regretted the fact that I did when I when I looked at Burrow's face, when I looked at Josh Allen's face, when I saw Stefan Diggs and a panic out there, I mean, those guys were in an utter state of shock out there. And we're used to seeing football injuries. We're used to seeing carts. We're used to that time seeing ambulances. We're used to seeing guys break bones. And sometimes it's gruesome, but you know, they're going to be all right to see yeah. a lifeless teammate, to see a lifeless brother, uh, you know, on the field like that. Our sideline guy was on the Bills sideline. DeMar Hamlin's mom was trying to get on the field, and there was no entrance to the field where she was, so they had to bring her around the stadium to the tunnel where the ambulance was. I mean, it was it was, it was, was chaotic. It was traumatic, and they made the right decision. And, and I know um, there's going to be a lot of Cincinnati fans listening in that, that aren't happy that this game's in Buffalo this weekend. And, look, the NFL did the best they could, and I believe it. This is not a – I'm from Cincinnati, look – I get it, and and we kind of – I don't want to say a victim mentality, but sometimes you're like, hey, we're a small market team. It's easy to say, nah, don't don't give the Bengals that game. You right. know, we'll have a coin flip if, if the Bengals lose to the Ravens. Look, the NFL did the best they could, and, and it stinks. And, and I don't know what the right answer is. If the Bengals win that game, they got – they're they're in line. If Kansas City – you know, they still – they would have got the two seats, so they would have hosted this one because Kansas City won out. Right. But it's just a tough situation. It is. I mean, there's no right answer. Um, there's going to be heat to whatever decision, you know, is made. Um, but, yeah, it's the, the thing. When I saw Joe Burrow go up to Josh Allen and say, I'm so sorry, I was like, oh, my God, so sorry. What do you mean So you're so sorry? I, I, I was like, oh, what what is happening? Little did I know that, you know, Hamlin is lifeless and they got to bring him back. They got to bring him back to life. I mean, that's, that's basically, it was a life and death situation. You're like, you mentioned for nine it. minutes for nine minutes. Yeah, too. It, nine wasn't minutes. Like it was 10 seconds or 20 yeah. seconds. A buddy of mine, who's a cardiologist was texting me and he said, when they shocked him and that didn't revive him in that moment, he said, that's, that's a, that's a terrible sign, Eric. Yeah. I mean, oxygen, not going to the brain for all that period of time. You wonder what state of mind he's going to be in and what kind of facilities will he have uh, functionality? But it's, it's a remarkable story. He's got, looks like he's going to have a heck of a recovery, a heck of a quality of life. But I mean, and then, and then when I, when Zach went up to Sean McDermott and Zach said afterwards that Sean McDermott just leaned into him and said, look, I, I should be at the hospital with Demar. I, I'm, I should not be here coaching. That hit Zach Taylor. And that's the coaches in my mind, Eric. It wasn't the league. I think the league didn't know what the hell to do. Be honest. I think it was very – the leadership was questionable in my mind. The two coaches, I mean, kudos to those guys. You know, in a, in a time of crisis, true character shows. The true character of those two head coaches was nothing short of phenomenal. They took their teams off the football field, and they dictated – <laughs> what policy the NFL was going to do, you know, and then uh, Joe Burrow and the co and the co-captains go down to meet with the Bills captains and co-captains. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable. Everybody, everybody performed exactly the way you hoped leaders would. And, and uh, I thought the Bengals fan base was great. They're hugging Bills fans. What can I do to help you? What kind of assistance can I provide? I mean, the, the whole thing was, was remarkable. And, and the thing that struck me is I'd never seen a player, go off the field without a thumbs up. You know, there's an indicator that I'm okay. And he went off that field literally still lifeless. And I'm like, what the heck, man? I, I, I was like, oh boy, what 
this isn't good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll echo what you said about the leadership, the medical staff, UC Medical, the yep. the support that the city of Cincinnati uh, gave to Damar and his family, Jeff Ruby and others bringing meals over there. I yep. talked to Jeff Ruby, so uh, Jeff is taken care of with tickets this week. I got him all set. <laughs> uh, him, him, and I believe he's going to bring up his three kids to the game in Buffalo this weekend. And uh, I mean, that's a tiny gesture for what they did for the family that week and sure. just so much support. And, and I, I've bragged on the city of Cincinnati many times. It's easy for me to do being from there, but leaving the game, you know, I always say there's one in every crowd. You got a night game, a very anticipated night game at that. There's a lot of tailgating. I was walking through the parking lots for my, for my parking spot before the game. Cause I drove to the game and then drove back to Louisville that night. So I was parked amongst everybody else. I'm walking through tailgates I mean, it, it warmed my heart to see the city of Cincinnati as electric as it was pregame. But the fact that I'm walking out with everyone exiting the game for a game that they anticipated so much, and there's there's no grumbling. There's no, right. Right. you know, there no one no one was saying stuff that that was anything offensive towards the situation. It was it was a true sign of class by everyone involved, and and it was it was it made me proud to be from Cincinnati. I'll say that. I agree, man, 100,000%. And when you look at a team, like a football team, okay, everybody has an assignment, everybody has a role. You want to be where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to do. Like you said, the medical teams. I mean, the assistant uh, equipment guy that got the face mask off and the shoulder pads off so quickly. Uh, the assistant trainer that was doing professional CPR as quickly as he did. The professional care. It's like if you're going to have a, a heart you know, issue like that, you want it to be at a hospital, the next best place would be where it happened because of all the medical attention and, and just the quick and swift, everybody's right where they're supposed to be every an hour before every game, they go through the whole thing and everybody's assigned a role and know what they're supposed to do, hoping never to have to do it. But boy, when they had to do it, they all step up, man. And they all executed a, a, a plan to perfection and they saved a life as a result of it. It was amazing. Really. Yeah, was. In a situation that they were not expecting. Right. You know, one thing to go out. And when I did my Joe Theismann leg break, maybe in Cincinnati, they call it the crumb ride leg break, but yeah. you know, to go out there, set it, get me in the ambulance, get me in a surgery within an hour and a half. Like they're used to doing those types of things. Yep. And I'm not saying that it's not impressive when it's done, but they're used to that. This is a situation that you're you're prepared for, but you're just not expecting it. So it was it was unbelievable execution. So my feeling is DeMar Hamlin will be at Orchard Park. I, I know they were talking about for this game, uh, first the, the wild card playoff round with Miami, but I would think it being the Cincinnati Bengals, both the teams that were involved uh, with what was, you know, a life and death situation. Or the fans, I mean, Bill's Mafia, if they, if, if the Mar Hamlin comes out in the cart from the tunnel to midfield, gets out and acknowledges everybody, or if he's not up to that and they have him in, in, in some kind of a, a suite somewhere and they put him up on the jumbotron where everybody can see him right there, that is going to be, an, I, I almost fully expect it, that is going to be unbelievable, unbelievable to see happen. And it would be a, a fitting, I think, not conclusion, but a fitting Look how good it, it is. You can see it with your own eyes now. Not just hear about it, but look at this guy. What an amazing recovery. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, you know, what looked so doom and gloom turned into a celebration when the news got so much better. The Bills are playing the Patriots in week 18, and Naeem Hines runs back that opening kickoff. Josh Allen described it himself. It was spiritual. It was a spiritual moment. Yeah. It yeah. just didn't feel like a football game. Naeem Hines has never run a kickback in his career, and he runs that opening kickoff back, and everyone's holding up the three. Sean McDermott's got tears strolling down his face. Josh Allen is, is emotional on the sideline as well as he runs it back. And so this, this would be a moment that would be very special, and it's one of those special moments that the Bengals fans in attendance will appreciate, the Bills fans' attendance, people around the league will appreciate it because this became an ultimate – national story i mean the lead story on the today show fox for everybody this is their lead story not just sports networks and so this would be a great moment if he's up for it i'm not sure if he will be or not right i i'm wondering how bill's mafia when the Bengals get introduced i'm not saying they're going to cheer them 
But I, I don't, I'm not sure they'll boom as hard either because of the feeling that these two cities and, and these two teams and the coaches and the players that, I mean, they went through trauma together. You know, that's a bond that is very, very different and very, very strong. I, I don't know. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be kind of a weird dynamic out there for sure. It's going to be very interesting to be part of, I think. Yeah, I, I would imagine there will be cheers from many Bills fans as, as the Bengals go on the field. Now, they'll be right. as loud as they possibly can, trying to make it as hard as they can for them right. to operate on offense. But similar to when the Bengals came, and I know you're at the game, when the Bengals came after the year that they helped us get in the playoffs and break the yeah. playoff drought, they yeah. cheered when the Bengals came on the field because Andy Dalton had thrown the touchdown to Boyd to yeah. get us in the playoffs. And so in the preseason the next year, they cheered the Bengals. They cheered when Dalton yeah. made completions. Much different situation when you're talking about elimination from a playoff game or a preseason yeah. game. But I would imagine it's similar to that. That's a great point. That's that's really uh, well thought out. But you're right. It's preseason as opposed to postseason. Okay, so let's let's hit the football part of it a little bit. Uh, first round, the, the uh, wild card round of the playoffs. Very similar for both football teams. Division rival, you know, it's it, everybody knows what the other guy's going to do, how they're going to do it. Uh, they know a lot, and, and they muck it up for each other, you know. And and not necessarily is it going to be a beautiful performance, but, man, in a single elimination, all you want to do is survive in advance, and both teams were able to survive in advance. Yeah, you're right. And in two two different types of games, I, I, right. I got back in time to watch the – Bengals Ravens game but with the Bills Dolphins game the Bills were two drop passes away from that being a quick blowout and in the Dolphins being being completely done but the way the National Football League works you let a team hang around even if they have a third string quarterback in you can get beat on any day and the mm -hmm. Bills miss a blitz to start the second half and it's a sack fumble and now all of a sudden the Dolphins got the lead and in Orchard Park and the place is stunned now they made mm -hmm. enough plays but the Dolphins brought the house against the Bills. They played total risk-reward football. Josh threw for 352 yards, really close to throwing for 500 yards. He barely misses Steph Diggs on the first play of the game for an 85 or 75-yard touchdown. And then he miss, barely misses Gabe Davis. Shakir dropped the ball. That being said, they played a risk-reward brand of football defensively that Cincinnati doesn't need to do based upon their offense and the skill that they have on offense. So it'll be, it'll have a different look and feel as far as what this Bills offense looks like against the Bengals. And then the Bengals made a play. You know, they, yep. they had their backs against the wall. They're dealing with injuries on their offensive line. Burrow's got to get the ball out of his hands in less than two seconds because Baltimore's got a great defense and a great front with pass rushers. And they're also bringing some pressure against them, knowing. Hey, look, we do have a talent disadvantage in this game. We're on the road in a playoff game. We got to make something happen. And man, you want to talk about a big play? I was not there in the stands. I could hear it on TV, but holy smoke. What was that atmosphere like when when Hubbard was running that back? Oh, cra I mean, crazy. Off the hook. It it was absolutely nuts. I mean, you know, you you have a situation where a young young quarterback is he's channeling his his inner Trevor Lawrence. He just saw Trevor Lawrence the day before on TV extend the ball for a touchdown. So he's like, I'm going to do that too. But he's at the two yard line, you know, and he he's not an inspector gadget, you know. And and the, the the linebacker, the defensive line gets pushed. Linebackers stuff him and take him straight up. And Logan Wilson bats it out of there, and Sam gets it on the on the fly right in his hands, and and away he goes. I mean, you talk about <laughs> low red zone no points scored and seven points, a 14 point swing. And, but the thing is Jesse Bates makes this play where he knocks uh, the back out of bounds at the two yard line. That was a 14 point tackle. If yep. He doesn't make that play. It's a touchdown. Now they get a chance to have a goal line stand and they get a 14 point turnover as a result. And it was, it was crazy. The, the whole game, Eric, it, it was in my mind decided in the red zone four times Baltimore's in the red zone. They score one touchdown. Mm -hmm. They don't score one time, and they give up seven points by not scoring. I mean, that's unheard of from the two-yard line. And then, you know, they settle for a couple of field goals. In the low red zone, first and goal, three times, one touchdown. Same thing, only one fewer field goal. The game was won and lost in that red zone. There's no question about it. And I know Buffalo is very, very good in the red zone defensively. Ironically, though, uh, Josh Allen, five red zone interceptions, the most in the league, I mean – but th that was over a short period of time, wasn't it? He's over that. Yeah, he had went three years without turning the ball over in the red zone and then threw five this year. You Unreal. know, 
I don't know that some of it wasn't, you know, taking some chances because he's on fire. Um, you know, one, he he was on a rollout and didn't see a safety who was behind a defensive end. That's excusable. One, he was actually trying to throw the ball on the ground and a guy kind of tipped it up off the ground and caught it. That being said, you just can't put the ball at risk in those situations. You're in the red zone. You have points to score there. You mentioned the red zone playing a factor in the in the Ravens uh, Bengals game. You know, people always talk about turnovers and how important the turnover differential is, and I agree. But at the end of a game, if you show me the turnover differential in the game in the red zone scoring, I will tell nine times out of ten, I can predict who won the game, and I can generally tell you how close it is too. Yeah. Because yeah. even if you turn the ball over, if you can score on 80%, 90% of your red zone chances and you're moving the ball, you're going to win the game. Those yeah. are, I call them four-point plays. You know, that was a 14-point play that Hubbard yeah. and, and made. But they're generally – every play down there is four points. You're trying yeah. to wipe out their opportunity uh, to, to, to keep them out of the end zone. And, and I think that's going to be a factor this week because both of these teams are going to be able to move the ball. Look, I mean, you're, you got – Two of the best three quarterbacks in the league. I talked about the last time I was on here. I said the best thing about Mahomes, Burrow, and Allen right now is that none of the fan bases would trade any of them for either of the yeah. any of the other guys. That that's yeah. what makes it the best too. Everybody loves the guy that they have. They fit the city perfectly. They're in awesome football markets too, and it's it's a special deal. Now they're all in the AFC, and they're going to go to battle likely over the next ten or so years to see who represents the AFC each year. You know, incredible to me uh, in the Dolphins game in the playoffs, Josh Allen was sacked seven times and threw three interceptions, and they won the game. You look at those numbers, like, you don't win that football game. Buffalo won that football game. And to me, everybody knows about the Bills' offense. They finished second in the NFL in points scored. And, you know, it's like, oh, I can understand that. People sleep on the Bills' defense. They were second fewest points allowed in the National Football League at the conclusion of the season. Leslie Frazier has these guys defensively moving like they're on a string. I mean, it is like watching choreograph when I watch the Buffalo Bills defense. It is, they play so well together. It, everybody is exactly where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there, hitting the right gap. It's a beautiful thing to watch. And they play with a lot of effort too, similar to Cincinnati's defense. These are two high effort defenses. And I know that uh, casual fans will say, well, that everybody should play with high effort in the NFL. Well, it's not always the case. You don't have 11 guys flying to the football on every play, but both these teams are well coached. They respect their coaches. They bring in the right types of guys. It's amazing how these two franchises have been built now on high character. You know, they got that right type of DNA yep. that, that they're going to play that way. And that's why this Bills defense has been so good. I recently spoke with Von Miller on my podcast, Centered on Buffalo, and you know, it's it's a different game if Von Miller's out there. They still had a great year defensively, but I think this game comes down to who can rush the passer with a four-man rush. Yep. And, you know, it helps the Bills that Cincinnati's offensive line's banged up, and it helps the Bengals that Hubbard and Hendrickson both seem to be healthy at this point. Yeah, I think I think you're exactly right. I mean, if 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 Buffalo can get significant pressure with four and have seven on the back end. And the Bengals with their offensive line, it's like, okay, we're going to slide to help. Well, now for sliding, we better have a back chipping over here or a tight end slow or whatever. Now we can't have five. We only have four in the route, and you got seven guys covering four. It becomes starts to become that numbers game and that chess match. I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. When you look at the football part of the tragedy on Monday Night Football, the Bengals go uh, 75 yards in five plays. Boom, 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 and and, and uh, Burrow hits Boyd for a 14-yard touchdown. Back come Josh Allen and the and the Bills. The Bengals defense rises up in the red zone, though, and holds him to a field goal. Bengals are moving again, ball past midfield, but then the tragedy occurs. Do you think it's going to be that kind of track meet? What do you project in this football game? What do you think? I think it could. <clears throat> I definitely think it could be a track meet. Now – playoffs are generally especially early on sometimes yep. the emotion of the game the the stakes of the game how amped up these defenses are maybe with Cincinnati having some guys out and going on a silent count with new offensive linemen out there with all the crowd noise could play a factor into that this Bills defense similar to the Bengals at times this year uh with Lou Anaruma who I have a tremendous amount of respect for him and Leslie Frazier sometimes you get some yards and points early and then they game plan you and they they clamp you down 
That's yeah. been a lot of the Bills' mo this season, and I've had to explain that to some of my buddies who are big Bengals fans who thought that the the Bengals would likely put up fifty points. At some point, you know, the Bengals were going to have to beat them, probably in a different type of way. I'm not saying they couldn't, but you know, I don't know that it would have been a sixty minute track meet there. I agree with your statement you made earlier. You know, do keys to the game every week, like everybody does, and. All these turnovers in red zone. I mean, bottom line is that that's what you're talking about. You know, it's all about the ball. You don't want to give possessions away. You'd like to accumulate extras if you can. And when you get in that scoring zone, finalize it. Don't leave points on the field. You don't want to leave four points there as many times as the Baltimore Ravens did in last week's game against the Bengals. That's what cost them. And they lost the turnover battle by one. And that one was a, was a defensive touchdown. So you can't have a worse turnover than a defensive score. Cl- case closed. Yeah, you're right. And as I was watching that game, to me, the Bengals were just operating a lot more effortlessly. It seemed like everything Baltimore was getting was off script. It was a slant. It was a, a fake slant on a double move that they got Eli Apple on. It just seemed like Everything was off script, and, and even if the fumble in the jungle didn't happen, I think the Bengals would have been able to put up enough points to, to win that game ultimately. Fumble in the jungle. It's going to be – it's iconic. Sam Hubbard, even though you know he's, he's the local boy that made good, local kid that is, is getting it done, he will be a Bengals icon perpetuity for the rest of his life and beyond. It's going to be Hubbard generations – of, of uh, fame off of that play. That, that is, that's an incredible scenario. Eric, I can't thank you enough. I could talk football with you for days, never mind, you know, a podcast. Uh, you, you are definitely a football savant. I appreciate you carving time to join us here and uh, uh, with our Cincinnati common roots. So uh, I, I appreciate everything about you. Yeah. Like uh, the feelings are 100% mutual, Dave, and I, I can't wait to do it again sometime soon. You're the best. Have a great one. Likewise, brother. Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. Tina King!